On this week's episode, it's going to be a really fun episode. We're going to discuss all kinds of britches, like boxers, whitey tighties, the works. What? What? Uh, uh, Brich, britches. Bre- breaches, That's- not britches. Oh, breaches. Breaches. Also, it's oh. isn't it tidy whiteys? I, uh, uh, who cares? Whitey <laughs> tidies, tidy what? Uh, I don't well, know. Well, breaches is breaches. very different. That actually is exciting than it's going to happen on this show. And what makes a lot more sense than what I thought yeah, we were going to be talking about. Um, not more. Yes, data breaches. And there's some really, really serious ones and you're going to want to pay attention to this episode because it affects everybody. We're not going to just talk about one, but there's a multitude of breaches Can't that have occurred. Wait. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. So welcome to episode number 365 of Destination Linux, your favorite video podcast. My name is Ryan. I'm Michael. And I'm Jill. Now let's get this show on the road toward Destination Linux. It's time for community feedback, but before we get to that, I have a little follow-up to the weird britches versus breaches thing in the intro that Ryan did. I don't know why, but I thought, does everyone know what that means, or is it just like a southern U.S. kind of thing? Bridges. Well, in the process of going from the intro, there's a little bit of a break during the edit. I don't know if you could tell with the animations that happened, but um, I went down this weird rabbit hole of searching online. Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks, Ryan, for that. And I always knew the term to mean like underwear, like how you used it. Yeah. But it turns out it just means pants. Oh. And I think the the underwear part is the southern part of it. I'm not sure where that comes from. But thanks to this rabbit hole, I also now know that the word knickerbockers is another term for pants. Yes. So, So while Chicago has the bulls, Atlanta has the hawks, Houston has the Rockets and the Minnesota has the Timberwolves. The NBA team in New York is the Knicks, or now as I refer to it as the New York Pants. Whoa. Thanks, Oh, That is a serious rep. So are you telling me that the Knicks is short for Knickerbocker? Knickerbockers, yep. which yep. is pants? Which is pants. Yeah. So the whole basketball team's emblem is, is there is there insignia like pants? It's not. It should be. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it used to be. It used to include those pants because it's a special kind of pants that oh. you might see in like a period piece movie where they're, you know, like pulled up to the knees or something. <laughs> it's okay. I think anyway it's refers to when you wear pants with Crocs and no socks. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's, that's what um. About. Yeah, thanks for that rabbit hole, Ryan. You're welcome. So let's. Man. <laughs> the things that the- you go chasing down uh, is unbelievable there. But that, uh, that's that's a good point. I mean, we have people listening in over 190 countries. They may not know the reference that we made there, but now yeah. you've cleared it up for everybody. And also, I've made yeah. it clear that the New York Pants is a good basketball team. Yeah, New York Pants is amazing. Uh, our community uh, feedback this week is from Jaden. He says, I listen to Destination <laughs> Linux each week, and I switched to Linux basically full-time this last year. I got tired of being the only person I knew that runs Linux and I decided to do something about it. Took a bit of work, but next semester, BYU, Idaho. I wonder if their emblem is uh, knicker boxers, bockers. Probably not. I think it's just like a hat. <laughs> gotcha. Well, they will officially have the Linux and open source society. No, it's, it's Idaho. It's a potato you. sack, man. It's a potato sack. Is it a potato sack? Is that their? I don't Worn as pants because it's Idaho potatoes. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's you're, you're interrupting Jaden's actually... big announcement here, Michael, with your stupidity. He's talking about he's officially launched the Linux and Open Source Society, and he's reaching out to see if we would be willing to join them over Zoom or Teams or something to discuss, present on some kind of Linux or open source software topic. Do you really want us after that intro to come to your <laughs> society to do? Hey, Jaden, I, I apologize for my stupidity. Yeah. Like, <laughs> It'd be embarrassing. They, they may leave Linux after we come talk to them. <laughs> this would be any Wednesday between April 22nd and July 17th. So first of all, Jaden, thank you for listening each week. That means so much to all of us. And when we were at scale, we had so many people coming up telling us that how much the show means to them. And that means the world to us. Makes us want to keep doing the show and continuing. And also congratulations on switching to Linux full time and getting actively involved in the community running your own Linux and open source society, which sounds really cool, like 
an open source society instead of just a lug. It's a society. Yeah, the Linux user group. Now, now I want to make it an open source society. Like, yeah, you know? open source society. Yeah. It sounds like so much it. more like devious too. Like it's dark I mean, and secret, like skull and yeah. bones-ish. <laughs> I don't think that's the best marketing att- ploy there, Ryan. So I mean, because everyone wants to join like a skull oh, and bones when you're in college. But that's funny because um, when you... <laughs> When you go to one of these Linux and open source societies, you're at a loss. I don't. I don't get it. It spell. It spells loss, bro. L O S S. Oh, it does. Your brain, man. Your brain is just wired. Jaden, I apologize for Ryan's stupidity right there. Man, I mean, you're just looking at the acronym. Who just automatically looks at the acronym of something? Your brain is wired, weird, man. Just like the rabbit hole you went down with Ryan Britches. Tech nerds. You know? That's who looks at acronyms Tech all the nerds. time. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, what are you talking true. about? <laughs> all right, Jay, now that we've convinced you to rescind your invitation, let me do this. <laughs> Here's what I think. I, I think it would be easier and more fun. And let us know if you're open to this. Write us another email. Let us know. If we invite your entire society, your secret society, to come join us for free, to do a live recording of DL. We usually record on Wednesday. So you pick a Wednesday in between that date time and you invite them to come and do a live recording. So they can watch us use Linux to make the show, number one, which is pretty cool. And then number two, afterwards, we'll open it up for Q&A and you can ask us or anybody in the secret society. And they they can wear masks, they can wear anonymous masks or anything else if it's super, super secret. I'm teasing. Uh, but they can ask us any question they want about Linux and open source, and we'd be happy to answer it. And this it. is typically only an exclusive th- a perk of our patrons, yeah. and we are offering it because of how much They're we college appreciate the yeah. secret society that you have started. Yeah, and, I appreciate the name. Because um, if I start a lug, it's not going to be called lug anymore. It's going to be a society. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. Your, your society will be our special guests. Yeah. I think you would enjoy that. And then, you know, maybe we'll do the other thing too, but I think they would really enjoy seeing Linux. Yeah, I think it'd be really cool. Really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So let us know, Jaden. Write us an email. Let us know if that sounds good to you. And we'd love to have you and the Secret Society join us. And if you're out there and you want to ask us a question from the community, you can send your questions to destinationlinux.net slash comments. And you can be a part of the show. You help make the show happen. Every week we do community feedback. You could be part of the show. You could be part of the feedback. Our society. Our secret uh, comments society. Yeah, our secret (laughs) comment society. You can just go to destinationlinux.net slash comments. And we too could uh, apologize to how stupid we are in your comments section. Could you do a destinationlinux.net slash secret society? I could. Where would it go? To our secret society email box. (laughs) <laughs> I, mean, I mean, wouldn't that kind of defeat the point of it being secret? You just said it on the show. Oh, well, yeah. We'll think on that one. We'll think on that yeah, one. We'll think about that one. When you go through an airport security, there's uh, one line where you go through to check the TSA, uh, getting your ID checking. And then there's the other line where a machine scans your bag. And mm. then if you're lucky, that's all the lines you have. But sometimes there's a few more. But the same thing happens in enterprise security too. And by in the same thing, I mean, there's multiple levels of checks, not for passengers and luggage, but for end users and their devices. And, and wow, comparing this to an airport is interesting because being in corporate America for so many years, uh, TSA is extraordinarily frustrating, probably the worst part of travel. And uh, corporate security is also the worst part about being a corporation. So I, I see how those two connect there perfectly. And also it might connect a little level, but at the point where, you know, the people who are the TSA agents are dealing with the stuff that's very frustrating because they're dealing with thousands of people who are doing it wrong and not prepared for certain things at certain times. And then you have the security team who are dealing with people who don't know how to use their devices sometimes and, you know, wide variety of things. But, you know, these days, most companies are good at the first part of checking user identity. They have some kind of solution there. But user devices, well, that isn't always the case because sometimes they could just roll right through the authentication process without getting inspected at all. Like sometimes your bags might not get inspected at all. Uh, In fact, 47% of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices to access their data. That means an employee 
can log in from a laptop that has its firework t- firewall turned off and hasn't been updated in six months. Like Ryan takes forever to update stuff. Wait, what? You know? I yeah. update all the time. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, that was me. That's that you. Was me. That's you. Yeah, right. Okay. That's you wouldn't be tra- AI. You shouldn't be trusted. That's the problem. All these other people, they're no, like, no, no. You. I update the stuff that I need and to they, to connect to mach- like stuff like this. Just, yeah. you know. They need all the corporations need to kick Michael off their network immediately because he's <laughs> untrusted. <and laughs> no, this, this system is up to date. I just want to verify right, that, that, that you there. know, that's no but longer think about a problem. All the apps and things people put on their personal devices and so many businesses. Oh, yeah. They require you to utilize your personal device as kind of your 2FA and also your security to get into your VPN for your business. And on top of that, they've got TikTok and Facebook and any other random scanning or apps. Or just, yeah, just trash. weird random apps they download that yeah. have like tons of ads or, you know, some kind of coupon app or something, you know? Yeah. And, and then these apps request permissions, like give me permission to your network, give me permission to search your network stuff, give me permission in the corporation. Give me permission to your, uh, your location for some reason. Yeah, and the corporations are all, their data is going to get zapped up in that app just like anybody else's if there's nothing to stop it. But luckily, there is something to stop it, and that's called Collide. Because Collide solves the device trust problem. They in- ensure that that no device can log into your Okta-protected apps unless it passes your security checks. Plus, you can use Collide on devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet, contractor devices, and the BYOD or bring your own device stuff like phones and laptops in your company. So you can have it. And the best part about Collide is that if they find an issue, you don't have to tell the person to contact security team. They can actually explain to them what they need to do to fix the authentication problem, which is fantastic because it saves your team time for working on everybody's device. And it also makes it possible for if someone hits a hiccup, like a roadblock, they can get past it which is very important. So visit destinationlinux.net slash collide to watch a demo and to see how it works. That's destinationlinux.net slash K-O-L-I-D-E. Whether we're talking about keeping doors locked or trying to protect users on the internet, security is very important. Back doors can be very useful when you need to take your dog for a walk, but you never want to hear that term when it comes to computer security. So let's talk about back doors found in a compression utility called XE. Huh. Here's what we know about this. The XE utils back door that almost infected the world. That might seem like a, an exaggeration, but by the time we're done talking about this, you'll see why it's a very accurate way of describing it. Yeah. This back door was a, it could have provided attackers with a very powerful foothold on millions of devices. And this is huge. This is the biggest news of Linux right now. Linux is all over the news, but not for the right reasons at all this week. Uh, open That's source true. is all over the news. And in fact, I was reading articles about people using this, which we're going to talk about and explain what it is, as a justification for why open source is dangerous with AI. You remember a couple episodes? Ryan, it's we uniquely yeah. dangerous. Be more accurate dangerous. with your, oh, your boy. Brain. So now they're they're rekindling that discussion and saying this could be used as you know ammunition towards that. Even though when we get into it, I mean anybody, Microsoft, Mac OS, anything could yeah. be vulnerable to these type <laughs> of attacks. But this is a unique situation. Um, if you remember last week, we did plan on having an awesome interview that we kind of hyped up about scale, uh, that we took at scale, but we this XZ thing is so freaking big that we kind of had to change the entire show last minute and really do a ton of research on this, which huge thanks to Michael uh, for taking a lot of time to make sure we were all educated on what was going on here. So Michael, kind of explain what, why is this a big deal, this XZ? I mean, XZ it just seems like two letters of the alphabet. Why do I care? It, it is two letters out. That's true. But first, before uh-huh. we do in, go into that, Jill, I would like to uh, make a note. If you would uh, write the time and day that Ryan complimented me on the show. Dang it. So yeah. We have like. evidence that it happened. Oh, man. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I Thank got you, Jill. it. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. All right. So the first thing's first. Um, people are talking about how this is only affecting servers, and that's basically true, but considering the vast majority of the world runs on Linux servers, it's, you know, it's a pretty terrifying thing of what could have happened. So this is very important. Now, let's talk about what XZUtils is. Uh, First, it's practically ubiquitous in Linux. It's pretty much providing the lossless data compression for 
pretty much every distro. It's everywhere. And Xutils provides critical functions for compressing and decompressing data during all sorts of operations. XE also supports the legacy.lzma format, making this component even more crucial. Now, Andres Freund, hopefully I said that right, uh, is a de- who is a developer and engineer working in Microsoft, was troubleshooting some performance problems in his Debian system, was basically finding things that were weird with SSH during some Postgres testing. He noticed that SSH logins were consuming too many CPU cycles mm. and were generating errors with Valgrind, a utility for monitoring computer memory. Wait a minute. Now, are you going to tell me that Microsoft, the one that hearts Linux, is the one who saved the day here? They've got the cape on and they're like, boom. No. Oh. Don't. Not at all. I okay. will say that it's good that Microsoft hired this individual because clearly this is a good person who is helping the world uh, and also knows what he's doing. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, that it really, it was pure luck that it happened. It's it an was, interesting thing to notice, right? Like, I don't yeah. know that I would ever be specifically looking at my CPU cycles during a login. Well, okay. First of all, he was actually troubleshooting and testing things while he was doing it. And he's also using Debian SID. So he was doing things in like tr- purposefully trying to test. He wasn't testing for this. He was testing for Postgres. But found. I this wonder what as Linux well. secret society this person's a part of because I want to join that one too. They're pretty <laughs> dope. That'd be awesome. Well, you might not want to know because he's a crypto uh, cryptographer, cryptographer. How he's cryptographer, cryptographer, and then there's probably like some kind of encryption level of trying to get access to it. Uh, it's no problem for and, me. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, no problem awesome. at all. Uh, so, Andres, uh, feel free to contact us at destinationlinux.net slash comments to see if Ryan can actually. Be yeah. a part of your secret decrypt society. anything you send at me, no problem. <laughs> as long as you give me the the code answer to do it. <laughs> yes, I'll type that Perfect. in, no problem, and it will decrypt. It. I'm so yeah. impressed by your skills. Thank you, appreciate it. So let's get back to the topic, shall we? Okay. So this backdoor was using a sophisticated system of hiding the stuff within a proverbial Russian doll of scripts and binaries, and hmm. the backdoor manipulated SSH. Uh, SSHD, the executable file used to make remote SSH connections. It, essentially, it made it possible for anyone in possession of a predetermined encryption key to put any code of their choice See? in an SSH login so you certificate. Break it. Any code you want, and you just break it. That's what they were doing. That's crazy. Yeah. Think about this. Think about how many servers, even on this show, we SSH into because it's the most secure method to get into your servers. And we utilize that thinking we're completely secure, safe and secure getting into them. Like when I set up SSH, I feel like every time I get it set up correctly and disable every other type of login, that I have I have the ultimate security package in play. Like I've done everything I need to. And here, well, this was made specifically to work around that. Yes. And you could type anything you want and it would accept it. That's crazy. That's crazy. So, so what's interesting is the way it worked is that it wasn't really affecting SSH. It was doing something where some distributions actually patch uh, SSH and systemd to work together, and systemd uses LZMA, and oh. that is it's kind of like a middle piece. So they were attacking XZ so they could put a payload into LZM, LZMA, uh, LZMA yeah. and then that would then uh, kind of pretend to be SSH essentially. That's so advanced. That would, yeah, it's it's very advanced. It's it's. If it wasn't so awful and horrible as this person obviously is, or whoever did it, it would be impressive. Because this seems more like a government level hack to me. Like this is a government sponsored hack okay, level well, of genius. No one knows who did it or how many people did it or anything like that. It's just basically we have a pseudonym and that's nobody all we knows. Have. It could be a dog, it could be a cat. It could be a it, little it, mouse. It could be one of any of those. And if we could find a dog, a cat, or a mouse that has that level of intelligence, we need to find them and give them the, anyone. the best chew toy ever created on the planet because they deserve it. Why would we reward them for hacking us? It's a very smart Fido. dog. It's a very <laughs> smart dog. And well, I just want to I just want to pet that dog. <laughs> well, As know? we know, animals uh, are good at tunneling, and this is like a multi-level tunneling scheme. <laughs> Brilliant, Jill. Yeah, love Brilliant. it, Jill. Love it. Uh, so what's cool about it, and actually, is that it's very interesting because it was basically hidden inside of like binaries that which then opened some scripts, which then called other scripts, which pulled in mm-hmm. other scripts, and eventually 
injected some like make files that after multiple levels of these things, that's when you see the payload being made. And we don't really know what was intended because no one's actually seen anything uploaded. But in theory, the code could allow for just about anything, it seems. Mm -hmm. So the attacks appear to be the result of a a meticulously planned social engineering campaign. And the attacker, which is using the alias JIAT75 and eventually started calling themselves Giatan. We don't know if this is a person or a group. I would or know whatever, right then it was a, a dog. Scam. Because it, the T75. The T75, that's like a Terminator. Terminator, thing. yeah, it could yeah. be. Yeah. 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 That's, I would have known immediately. I would have never let that person through. That's m- why I need to run these projects. Yeah. Yes. G-A-T-T-75. You should run a project that you have no ability whatsoever to maintain. You don't know that. You don't know how good I is. A uh, good I is. Okay, anyway, so this process started in 2022, so it's been a long time. They put a lot of effort into this, and they basically posed as a concerned user and were ledger- leveraging the support of other like seemingly new participants who were even using like bill- bullying techniques for the dev by claiming they weren't doing a good job and even should be ashamed, and the attacker was, because of this, was eventually, they kind of like, burned them out and that they offend like they sh- they look like they were trying to do good and at posting you know good uh, updates and pull requests and all that sort of stuff so they became a maintainer that's and, interesting so yeah it was very so it's what very, we're learning here and this is all we know to this point i want to be very clear that these type of stories they evolve over time so based on what we've you know all the research michael's done what we've read and things this is what we know so far this is kind of the I would say allegation phase where things right. are uncovering and it could change at any point. But and it's also based on like when we recorded this. So if, if right. once you see this, there's going to be like a couple days for the edit and all that, right? Right. But based on what we know so far or what has been alleged so far, this is a really sophisticated attack and it works because of the fact you've got this single maintainer running something so critical and crucial for the overall Linux open source community like it's being used all kinds of places within linux this super important package you've got a maintainer one, who's not being paid i'm guessing to maintain this based on my research no they weren't but yeah. also i could be wrong about that you know and um, they they basically start getting some type of low level bullying of hey you know you could do better you should be doing updates more frequently whatever it was to the point where they're just like you know what i'm burnt out you have this thing. And then once they had it, that's when we believe this back door starts to get introduced, right? And Oh, yeah. Once they, they had it, they started year. doing multiple things to kind of... Right. They even started contacting various distributions, trying to get them to put it in faster and Ooh. update more, more quickly and things like that. And to the point where people from Fedora and people from Debian were commenting how they talked to this person who was very insistent on getting things pushed in and how these new features were so important that they had to get them in, but turns out the new feature is a backdoor. So ah, not uh, good that it didn't actually. Did they know get about it. the backdoor? Maybe they were double duped. It was a double spy thing. What do they call okay, that? Now, you, now you're you're putting way too much, like a double yeah. agent. Double yeah. agent. Yes, yeah. it was a double agent thing. You never know. Maybe GIA um, T seventy five was innocent. Probably. Who knows? Who knows? It's yeah. possible that that person created an account. And basically did this, but someone yeah. else took it over in the meantime. Who, this is crazy. I, it's hard to say because of how, like, it doesn't seem like they were innocent, but it, it doesn't, like, there's no way to tell for sure because this is this is a nuts situation. So what distros are jacked up with this? Like, so, I just installed Kali Linux because I'm doing a bunch one. of cyber <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Of course. Um, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. So there's a, there's a few. But it, it's it's also important to know that it didn't really get into the mainstream level of Linux. So the versions that are in, uh, affected by this backdoor is uh, XZUtils 5.6.0 and 5.6.1. If you have any other version, you're not affected by this. Now, the, the backdoor basically was very close. I saw someone say that it was like just a few weeks away from being a, in all these different mainstream distributions. And that's not really true because, you know, uh, Red Hat, there's the release for Red Hat is going to be from a while. Uh, yeah. Debian is going to be Debian. for a while from now. Uh, even Ubuntu is going to be at least six months because they're yeah, not going to be able to push it. probably hit pretty quick, though. 
Well, that is true. And also Arch did get affected by this, but it, they implement System D in a different way. So their users weren't even affected by it. Oh, uh, but cool. it's still important to update your system to not have this backdoor yeah. regardless yeah. because who knows what could actually happen. But it's good to know that Debian, Red Hat, and all these things, while they were the targets, it, it got into some distributions that weren't necessarily targets because it's really interesting that they were focusing on Deb-based and RPM-based distributions, uh, which makes sense considering like most of the, the servers on, the, on servers. the... Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. if you're using Arch Linux, you're probably... As a server, you're probably be very much more vigilant, or you should be, if you're doing that. Uh, in terms of like the long term support of Ubuntu and Debian and, yeah. and Rail, well, the broad and all those stroke things, of you know? servers, you, people do run Arch servers. It, it happens, but it's not as prevalent as say a Debian or Red Hat and that type of stuff. So. And they're also not there for as long, you know. Like, that, but you that know, kind of in thing. a way, I feel like open source worked. Didn't it? The whole open source model worked. We had because the code still had to be open source. Even though this actor buried this in this, which I love the visual you gave of a Russian doll uh, style attack here, <laughs> you know, the open source community still found it because the code was open source and stopped it in its track. So this is a big deal. And this, to me, talks about the dangers of having single individuals, developers responsible for major packages that run entire infrastructures of industries. Not just companies, but entire industries are utilizing Linux servers and cloud servers and all of this stuff now that it could have impacted. Everybody, every company I've ever known, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, all use SSH to get into their servers. And we've got this one lone person responsible for this package. And Insert I know the notorious XKCD of the blocks yeah. and there's one little tiny person who's maintaining this massive project that's super important but everybody ignores it kind of thing uh, which yeah. happens all the yeah. time um, it's interesting. Th this is a this is a very um nutty situation like it's it's it, you what your point is is that open source worked or, in this case worked. yeah mm -hmm. and it kind of did but also it's not really an accurate way of describing it because uh Linus Torvalds has a famous quote about with enough eyes, all issues become like shallow. Uh, all bugs become shallow. This was one eye set of eyeballs, and it was someone who luckily found it. And I, I, I saw this person, I forgot who it was, but I saw someone re refer to this as effectively, in terms of security, like cybersecurity or security research of winning the lottery because of how unlikely the configuration of what was needed to actually happen right. was yeah. that happened. So, and also how important and how big of a backdoor this would have been. Like, it, it, yes, it worked, but also uh, by the it skin of easily, our teeth, right? yeah, it was it's yeah. so barely that we but, have to address that part but too. You, you know, there are backdoors that are found in Windows. There are backdoors that are found on your phones. There are, well, are I mean, companies in terms of the in, that are known for stuff, making you should very popular. It to be there. There are companies that are known for making very popular software that you, now you don't even have to open a text from them. They just send you a text, and now they have access to your entire iPhone. Uh, this is generally government-funded software and things, but these type of programs exist. So these back doors are in closed-source software as well. So anybody looking at this and saying, like, this is a uniquely open source problem is very mistaken. I think open yeah. source worked, and yes, by the skin of our teeth in this case. And I think one of the things we have to think about in open source is these critical functions and packages that we have, and there's probably tens of thousands of them that have one single person responsible and doing all the work and maintaining it, and what happens. And you've got these billion-dollar companies out there utilizing this stuff, and to them, they're like, I don't know, it works. Like we SSH and stuff and we uncompress stuff with this XZ thing and it just works. So why am I going to pay for this developer or other people to look into this code? You know, those are some things we've got to think about. And I don't know the answer, but I will tell you unequivocally that this backdoor is not a unique thing to just Linux. These backdoors are everywhere. And also sometimes in the commercial, pro or not commercial, but the proprietary software, it's found that the people who made the software put it there on purpose. So it's it, it, that's, in my opinion, much more egregious than you know saying open source. Oh, this is a potential problem for the blah. I I, I think that there are 
much worse configurations that proprietary software have proven to be over the years, then this is more of a trust thing where the trust, the trustworthy, like the this open source community, open source world is kind of founded on the trust model. Mm-hmm. And this is an example of where that can be manipulated. Yeah, and this is rem- where you put your candy out on Halloween and you yeah. put a sign on it that says, take one. And then someone picks <laughs> up the whole yeah. bowl and walks away. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's a perfect ex- analogy for it. It also reminds me of that topic we covered a long time ago about the University of, I think, Minnesota, where they were testing the whole trustworthiness factor of the kernel and all this other stuff. And this news basically kind of confirms that they were right that the trustworthiness is an issue and we need to address it but also it's more than that it's it's also the fact that you know we have these projects that don't have any funding and we have maintainers who in this case was one person of this critical project who was almost it was like very close to burnout and these people just bullied him into becoming burned out and it's like this sort of thing, I don't know if we need a, like a fund to help pay for these people who are doing something so critical or how this would work, but uh, I think that I think there's tons of different ways to look at this and address it, and I don't okay. know if any First of them would of all, solve these I things. I want to give huge props to Andres, the oh, engineer yeah. and developer from Microsoft. I yeah. just want to say it again. I know we already did, but thank you yes. so much. The world for should thank your you. Work. There should be uh, like a giant uh, thing on Google that says "Thank you, Andreas." When people search really? for this, like they deserve, <laughs> they deserve an open source award and some bounty money and all kinds of stuff. I mean, they did some amazing work here, and maybe it was luck, but this person was doing some very thorough, oh, very yeah. thorough work here to be able to capture that the slowdown in the SSH logins were taking too many CPU cycles, whereas. If I was doing SSH and I noticed my machine slowing down, I'd be like, stupid internet. And that would be <laughs> it. You know, that's where I would. And then reboot. Be. Right. And reboot. And this person was obviously, you know. Just- and this person was also testing things for like first and assuming it was something in Debian and then finding that it wasn't and then finding where the actual, where it actually come from. And then also digging into that and then finding the payload and all this sort of stuff. Like this was. They said that they're not like a reverse engineer and they're not a cryptographer and that sort of stuff. But in this case, I mean, you kind of were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So good and job. <laughs> going back to the how open source, you know, does have that system of checks and balances. Just just think, uh, this could have happened with uh, Microsoft Windows, and it probably would have been released before it was caught. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, and also, yeah. <laughs> like, there's there's no way to know it, and like, yeah. and it's also people be like, well, this is clo- this is closed source proprietary, and for anybody who says the uniquely dangerous, do you think that you could possibly maybe hire someone that you thought you vetted, but really they were actually doing something like this under your nose, and you really have to still trust people that you're hiring, and the closed source thing does not actually solve anything whatsoever related to this. And yeah. the only thing it does is make sure that no one outside of the company can even see it. And sometimes no one outside of the department they're working in can even see it. So let's go ahead and just put that to bed. The yeah, idea I that think, open source is uniquely dangerous because of this yeah. is complete nonsense. nonsense. I think as a community, we have to realize that politically the world is just jacked up. Okay, that's the best way to put it. The world is jacked right now. Everybody's hating everybody. Not in the muscle way either, just... It just (laughs) messed up. Not jacked in a muscular way, jacked in the most messed up way possible. And and so I think you're going to see more of this type of activity happen where, and, and I'm not saying that happened here, but more of stuff that looks like you've got situations where people are being put into positions and companies to do things like this on behalf of governments or other stuff. And, you know, the program I was talking about that now is so advanced, it used to be you'd have to open a message and then they could take control of your iPhone or whatever. It's called Pegasus. And eventually this software makes its way out into the wild. Because once you start using the attack, right, people can start seeing the attack. And when this stuff gets out into the wild, then people can duplicate it. And so when you say like, when we're making statements like this could have happened to any OS, like it's literally already happened in far worse ways and has been executed in other OSs. And it will continue 
to be an attack vector that will be used against Linux and open source. And maybe there already is one and it's successful in some form or fashion. That's what I mean by things being jacked up. So you really have to be on top of your game. And Jill, I noticed in the notes, you put in there something like, hey, we should all be monitoring our systems for unusual activity, looking for anomalies, going through our authentication logs. And if that makes no sense to you, it's probably because you don't use SSH, so don't worry about it. But if you're using SSH, <laughs> looking through those logs and things like that is is an important thing that may give you some clues. And I've learned some things from Andreas here. I might keep my CPU monitoring tool up all the time now and like yeah. be looking for why why is that why did that take so long to open? Hmm. You know, I'm gonna be a little more sus of my machines when I'm getting at it. Be sus of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think an- another good thing at the the one, the positive thing we can get from the story is that, you know, Linus and the kernel developers and all the top developers on Linux have been trying to uh, make Linux even more secure than it had been. And it's events like this that really change the paradigm on how they do things and you know, how that affects the kernel and SSH. <laughs> so, so now that's going to be addressed more because they, because someone found a really amazing uh, multi-tunnel backdoor. <laughs> you know, I think the difference is Andreas didn't blindly trust the technology. Yeah. You know? and, and that's something we have to consider in any of this stuff that's supposed to be encrypted, supposed to be secure. It, it doesn't mean we just blindly trust it. And yeah. that's a good lesson, I think. Yeah, that's a very good lesson that um, I will maybe listen <laughs> Michael, you won't do anything because you'll just <laughs> later. Whatever. Uh, what, are, what are you talking about? Okay. Uh, also, one more thing I want to say. anyways because all your 50 <laughs> drives that contain the personal information are disconnected and randomly connected when you need to find the file anyway. And so, also, I don't know yeah. what file is where and what drive. Or, yeah, that's, on what drive. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It My might organization, actually help you. My organizational effort is not super high. Like it is tech. I've put a lot of effort into it and then I forgot and what drive it was on. And then I did it again. And then I, yeah. okay, let's, I'm not, <laughs> let's but not go into my security thing now. It like, is. I mean, yeah. there's no way you're going to find all my stuff because it's not on that drive. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, I just want to bring up something else is I think it's really important is that the reaction that we had for this is very good in terms of like, all the different distributions who are acting on it and like the way that Red Hat, there's something I wanted to mention about uh, two things, Red Hat and Debian. So first of all, Red Hat uh, associated this with their CVE system. And I found out because of this that purposeful malicious things are not typically signed CVEs. In fact, it's a ca- kind of against the rules of CVEs to assign a rating to a malicious thing. And that shocked me. Like, why would that not mm, be included? That's weird. Do they have another code that they assign no, to malicious no, no, things? No, 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 no. Like a no. code, a code red, code no. bubblegum? No. Code Crocs? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Code Crocs. <laughs> I was waiting for you to get the Crocs, it's, and then yes. It's okay, so finally. bad that we named it Code Crocs, and that's when we assign it a Croc level of urgency. <laughs> Uh, cause it's, you know, cause it's such a crock. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. the, that's the thing. So, uh, anyway, Red Hat doing this is very important. Cause first of all, it was a critical, like 10 out of 10 horrible. Yeah. And the fact that they put effort into making sure that this was like, I just wanted to p- give them some respect for it because they essentially like kind of broke the rules or whatever. And, uh, it's important because that was used as evidence for, uh, everyone to dig into it and that sort of stuff. And then we saw distributions like Debian who shut down their entire build system in order to address this. Cause it's, and it's not necessarily like, Oh, we well, can just pull the packages out. They have to build a ton of stuff that are dependent on it. Yeah. And yeah. this thing is maybe dependent on other things and all that. They have to do all this stuff. And it's, it's very, it's very um, like respectable uh, respectable that they are doing this sort of thing. Yeah, because a lot of people had to put in a lot it's of massive late nights effort. Yeah, and a lot of work, and probably are still putting in late nights and a lot of work because of this. And what Michael's saying is, we on this show are putting some respect on that. Thank mm-hmm. you for yes, the late absolutely. nights and the work. And, and also Andreas, to this okay. person who did this whole thing or whoever did it, 
Uh, I can't wait for karma to completely destroy you. Yeah. Because that will be wonderful. You yeah. pen chewing crockware. <laughs> and I mean, and- that's actually uh, <laughs> uh, that's offensive to the pen chewing croc wearers. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I bet you they wear crocs. I bet you whoever did this is wearing crocs. That's all I'm saying. That's I mean, saying. I think it's much worse <laughs> than that. I think they have like these uh, cardboard boxes that the crocs came in and they were like, oh, we need to they use just this wear for those our on shoes. their feet. Yeah, exactly. Spin around in the boxes. <laughs> exactly. And they and they use like tape to like duct tape to wrap it around. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> Losers. Well, you know, I did want to mention one thing that you can do as a desktop user or as a server user is uh, make sure to um, use your package manager to downgrade to a safe version of XZ Utils. The, the, the compromised version was 5.6.0 and 5.6.1. And so downgrade to a safe version or upgrade to a newer patch version if your distro has it in place. There you go. Yeah. And also, important. this is an interesting thing. Um, Chris on JB was talking about um, rolling releases being like uh, attacked for people use making rolling releases and sort of stuff. And because it's like, Hey, if you didn't use a rolling release, you would be affected by this because if you're like, or like Cali, they are basically a rolling release. Not exactly, but kind of, Mm -hmm. or, you know, like arch didn't get it or Nick's OS didn't have this product, you know, you or opens as a tumbleweed would actually prop. That one's probably technically Nick's and arch don't do the same thing. And opens as a tumbleweed probably is affected, especially since it's an RPM based distro. And, uh, this is something that, I thought was interesting because the idea of people not using rolling releases is actually a terrible art like stance to have on this topic because it's literally the people who are using this sort of stuff that found it because the person who found it was using Debian Unstable. There you which, go. You know, yeah. Arch for like the win forever. That's oh, not Debian. what I said. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> Arch forever. I just wanted to say it's it's a very interesting stance because of the whole idea of like. Ro- yeah. You wouldn't yeah. be attacked by rolling, which is true. You wouldn't have been attacked. You wouldn't have been affected by this if you weren't using rolling. But also, y- these people who are using the rolling are the ones who found it. So well, you might have you know. been attacked. You might have been attacked because it's very possible. Eventually, it made it if into this a wasn't release. found by the person yeah. using by an Andreas, by like, right. if this wasn't found, it likely would have gotten into all of the main distributions and yeah. all of the LTS versions and whatever because. It was not a likelihood. I believe of this being Simon right. Quigley would have found it because he's a freaking genius. Yeah, um, quite I possible. Think, yes, and if I you want to know who anyone that was going to find it, besides Aww. Andrea, that's true. And if you want to know who that is, you could check out uh, the show notes because we have a link to the interview we had with Simon. It was very interesting. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over twenty years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since twenty ten, and Linstore industry-leading open-source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open-source community, and they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features. Linbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms and OSs without vendor lock-in. What that means is, is that you could choose the software on any platform, including specific hardware, that you want to use or just off the shelf hardware that you get and connect it. You get, all of this stuff can be interchanged really easily. And with DRBD and Linstore, you can have high speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache cloud or open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long distance replication. Linbit is run by its founders to this day and all of its engineers and developers are in house with offices in Europe and North America which allows them to have global 24-7 support to complement their enterprise offerings. Visit linbit.com to learn more about the people behind Linbit and the awesome software for block storage, duplication, and more. I've got some more great news for you, Michael, because like, why stop the good news train when it's already choo-choo and full steam ahead, you know? I don't, under- I don't think you know what the word good means. No, this is, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> this is actually terrible. Uh, so in the news this week, there's been a bunch of data breaches. Uh, AT&T suffered a massive data breach of 73 million customers. And That's I know a lot of bridges. Point, yeah. <laughs> at this point, when you hear about a data breach, you're kind of like, okay, they got my email, they got my username. So what? But this one's this one's worse because yeah. these hackers are already sharing this information on the dark web. 
and it impacts both current and former customers. So if you've ever had AT&T at some point, you may be impacted by this. And so it's 7.6 million current users, but 65.4 million former users. And what this is, is your social security number, potentially your full name, email, mailing address, phone number, date of birth, and your AT&T account number and your passcode. So oh, essentially, that's, that's all? Okay. That's all? <laughs> yeah. Credit cards too. Yeah, it's... <laughs> This is a rough one. This is really rough. AT&T has determined, this is them quoting, uh, that AT&T data-specific fields were contained in a data set released on the dark web approximately two weeks ago. With respect to the balance of the data set, which includes personal information, such as social security numbers, the source of the data is still being assessed. Uh, so they're not sure if this was from an internal uh, breach or if this was a vendor, but... Uh, I'm glad way, that they, they have uh, so much information to help you know tell us about... Yeah, the attack that caused seventy-three million people to. Well, you know, they uh, are probably got a lot of lawyers and a lot of lawsuits pending on this one, so they're going to be. Yeah, this is very much very a, a lawyer speak uh, response. Yeah. They're going to be very careful with what they yeah. say. Um, but if that wasn't exciting enough for you, how about the Cyber Safety Review Board appointed in twenty twenty one after Microsoft was hit with a cybersecurity hack? that specifically targeted U.S. officials' emails, found Microsoft at fault for uh, shoddy cybersecurity practices, lax corporate culture, and a lack of sincerity regarding the knowledge of the breach. Uh, They also recommended Microsoft pause any further deployment of cloud services until they fix their security issues. And in this Chinese uh, brokered hack, I guess, the Chinese government hack, Microsoft Exchange Online email of 22 organizations and more than 500 individuals were breached for up to six weeks. So now, again, this was back in 2021, but after it happened, it was so serious, they appointed a cyber safety review board and apparently took them three years to come back with an evaluation uh, of which... And that evaluation is Microsoft's at fault. So this is interesting because, first of all, um, good job, Microsoft, for hiring Andreas, who helped everybody in the planet. good there. And... um, Plus one. Sarcastically good job for all this crap. Negative one. So now you're back to zero, Microsoft. Back to zero. <laughs> back to zero. Help us help you, Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the state of things, though. As these, as these hacks get more sophisticated, and as I think more government agencies continue to hack each other, they're going to get more and more sophisticated because there's just so much money piling in it. And everything essentially is getting breached, which means you have to be very careful with the information that you're putting out there. And if that doesn't depress you Hold enough... On. Before we go into that, I just want to bring out one thing. Uh-huh. This whole thing is about like pol- uh, politicians getting their information co- uh, st- taken from this breach and all this sort of stuff. And I would just like to ask the politicians or the U.S. officials who are involved in this, how do you feel now about purposely putting back doors and operating systems that you spent a lot of time trying to argue that that was a good idea? Do you think that would be a good idea now, considering you would be giving them the door to take all of your stuff? I mean, Michael, you're trying to use like reasoning and stuff with these people. They don't, they don't even know. How <laughs> you're right. Their that's works. a good. That's a good point. I mean, I, they don't even know how they're. I retract it because just magical, probably. Yeah, they know, probably tablet. wouldn't have the ability to click on our podcast to watch it because yeah. that would require a computer. Yeah. Or a phone, and that Which they might wouldn't not know how to be... turn that on. Well, they know how to use their phone because I see them <laughs> using it when they're supposed to be listening to like really important dialogue and laws being passed and stuff. I see them playing Tetris and sitting on Facebook. Speaking of Facebook, <laughs> uh, it turns out in some court documents <laughs> unsealed last week that Facebook was letting Netflix peek into your DMs. So the allegation uh-huh. in the court filing is an anti competitive lawsuit that's been filed stating that Facebook allowed this to happen for over a decade. So Netflix could build better advertising towards oh, wow. its users. So, I don't remember when I stopped using Facebook, but I I cannot guarantee you it was over a decade. So that's a very long time for them to allow Netflix to slide into your DMs. Slide into your DMs. So <laughs> did you ever think when you were using your DMs, Michael, when you were sliding into other people's DMs that that was safe and secure and private back then? Uh, No, absolutely yeah. not. Okay. Because... There is this term, I don't remember where I had this conversation, but a long time ago, I had a conversation when someone said, you know why they call it DMs and not PMs, right? Because PMs means private message, and these are not private. These are direct Mm. message, and that's why they call it DM. 
And that, when as soon as I heard that, this was m- over a decade ago, I thought that's a that's such a brilliant observation because you will notice that none of these companies call them PMs anymore. They're all DMs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did hear also that Google now has to delete like millions of records for their incognito mode. Yeah, I did see yeah, that. I yeah, I saw that. Which yeah. is interesting because they um, they said that the incognito is not tracking the information and it's not tracking locally on your browser, but they're still tracking it. Yeah, it was and millions of users and love. billions of data points that they're going to have to delete. And all in all, what this means is there's a lot of law firms that are about to get really rich. <laughs> a lot of law firms that yes. like this news. Yeah, this this if you're in a law <laughs> firm right now, you should consider advertising with us because we just made you billions and dollars. Now, for all of you who've been affected by one of these, first of all, um, very sorry. It sucks to have your privacy and things invaded by this. But the good news is once these lawsuits are concluded, you are likely to get yet another free credit monitoring service and a three dollar Starbucks gift card uh, that you can use at your convenience. <laughs> and if you're like you're, me, yes, you're likely point, to get basically nothing from this. Uh, I mean, or, or a ten dollar check in the mail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I have if two we were so or lucky three for that free job. credit yeah. monitoring <laughs> services right now. Oh, you're creating from, like a collection. I think yeah. I'm collecting them all. Like I just because every company that gets breached is like, now you get free credit monitoring. I'm like, man, I've got so many people monitoring my credit. I'm just feeling really safe right now, except for the fact that the credit agencies themselves were hacked not so long ago. So, but they also yeah. offered free credit uh, yeah. monitoring for a year. Thanks, Thank like, goodness. hey, guess what? This is going to cost a lot of money after you forget that you had signed up for this. Yeah. So yeah. But uh, once thanks, you're in Equifax. line at Starbucks and you get your Frappuccino, you kind of be like, yeah, was the data breach that bad? <laughs> Maybe not, you know? So that's what they're hoping I'm for. I'm getting this Frappuccino and they have my social security number. <laughs> Fair trade? Uh. <laughs> uh, so By the way, uh, we're not saying Starbucks is involved in this. No. That's like just Starbucks. how much money yeah. you're going to get from it is yeah. one thing from Starbucks. <laughs> if you're lucky. Honestly, you're lucky if, if you get anything lucky. outside of the free credit monitoring. I got, this, I got this email that's probably spam, but I didn't even bother because it was something like, uh, you've been uh, a part of this breach, then you can get this uh, check for blah, blah, blah. And I, I didn't even read it because it's probably four dollars, and like, yeah. I'm, it's not even worth my time to read that email because yeah, that's how but the ridiculous law firm these got things eighty are. billion. But oh yeah, yeah they were they're yeah. making bank. You get yeah. four bucks. Uh, so they're what, making bank, and we're uh, making piggy bank. What can yes. we do with all of this stuff? So a lot of it is cry? very difficult to stay out of some of these breaches. Not cry. Here are some things that will help. Whenever possible, avoid giving out your social security number. And when I think about saying this, what I what I envision in my mind is the many times I've gone to a doctor's office and on their little form, they say, put your social security number on here. And they don't need my social security number. You got my name, you got my driver's license, you have my insurance information. You need no social security number at all. And every time I've left it off of that document, guess what happens? They call the social security police and they arrest me. No, nothing happens. They never <laughs> even mention the fact that it's left. Blank. Next time, what you should do is put a smiley face like I do on the oh, signature yeah. things. And that should happens. be one of the tips too, is just sign your name yeah. with a smiley face or draw pictures randomly or, like Michael does. When people ask you for thing. information that is completely unnecessary, give them unnecessary nonsense yeah. and uh, let their data be breaching. Like if there's a data breach, they get garbage. And that's yeah. great because you're annoying the people who are hacking and also the company because they have worthless information. Good so one. You can I, freeze I, your credit with the yeah, three euros one. if you're in the US. It's a little annoying because when you need to use your credit, it's a little pain to get them undone. But I've done this. I love this. You go, you freeze your credit. You fill out some forms. Basically, you go to all three bureaus. You fill out a little form of information. You freeze it. And boom, nobody can open credit cards and things in your name because, you know, a lot of times these type of hacks, people will open phone accounts, they'll open, they'll try to do credit cards, they'll do other things. And it takes months before you may notice that your credit is hit with this stuff. So, you know, freeze your credit and use one of your many 18 or 20 now free credit monitoring services uh, to make sure that you're, you're not uh, a victim. You know what the worst part about yeah. this joke about the free monitoring services is that yeah. you're probably right, but also they <laughs> all happen at the same time, so you can't like back to back have 18 yeah, years of stack it. Them. Yeah, you should be able to stack them. But you know what, what we saying. should offer is a free credit monitoring service because I think they're in the right business. 
right? Like we should have a Tux digital free credit monitoring service. Yeah, and we'll just we'll just like uh, outsource yeah. that to some other company that does it, and then yeah, and then they'll have a data breach. And then <laughs> they'll we'll, have a data breach, but then we'll give them free credit monitoring service, which is free to us because it's our company. You know exactly. Yeah. We're so helpful. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, another. I like useful- I like this solution. Ryan. <laughs> it's genius. Another solution is to use a password manager and different passwords on every site. This is a really important one. Also, having a pseudo email address like you know uh, DuckDuckGo can give you an alias email address. Uh, there are many services. Proton can give you a uh, one if you pay for their service. So uh, use one of the alias emails and change your emails that you're using for the different sites. Mozilla Firefox has one as well yeah, have- where you can have a different email every time. Um, what this does is it allows it so that if they, for instance, you get breached on something maybe you don't totally care about. Maybe your Twitter account gets breached and you're like, eh, I don't really care that much. I mean, it sucks, but not that big of a deal. But if you use the same password across your bank and your mortgage company and your credit bureaus, when you set up those accounts and everything else, then they've kind of got you. And if they have your email address, then they have one half of everything they need to log in, right? Um, so two-factor authentication, very important as well. I use YubiKey, so you have a hardware solution. But having a password manager where you have different passwords on every site also can help the amount of damage somebody can do be a lot less. Also, um, mm-hmm. bang your head against the wall might help. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, at this point, <laughs> like it's not <laughs> have you been... Are you going to be breached? It's how many times have you have been you already breached? been breached, and how many times? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so. the the point about the passwords is like we should you should have a password for separate everything, but there are, there are so many people who know that and still don't do it. So it, it's yeah. it, you might be like, oh, I know this, and we've you've said it so many times. We say it so many times because people hear it and still don't do it, and it's easy to do it when you just have a password manager that generates it for you. So go do that. I mean, it, I think Nord did a study just like last year or something where still the number one password used was password one, two, three. So uh. <laughs> like people still don't get it. They think it's like clever or, you know. They'll never figure this out except for yeah. that's like the first thing that they test for. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, people still need to hear the message, but those are just some of the things that you can do that might help. And of course, also, if you have some other ideas, tip. send them. I back. have one more. I have another one. So if you have any, send us to net, let us know on destinationlinks.net slash comments. But if you would like to use this, I think this might be fun. So, you know, you go to these places like a drugstore or a grocery store and they ask you for your phone number. And I think that we should all just start using joke numbers. And I don't mean like make up a number. I think that would be bad because you might be adding someone's actual number. I mean like stuff from songs that are literally not able to have that number. So you pick whatever area code you want and then 8675309. Yeah. And put that into it and just see what happens. Okay. So, Michael, you know, that's like a huge thing, right? Yeah. That you've just <laughs> given out to everybody that a lot of people use that for Kroger and all their services. And the great thing is they've crowdsourced the funds so that everybody can get the free gas points and everything when they use that number because so many people are using it and buying things. And, you know, the more you buy, the more gas points and other stuff you get. And everyone's using that song with their area code. So you're crowdsourcing points. Did I accidentally just find a life it's hack? Genius. Is it is a saying? life hack, and it's actually one that's regularly used. So the 8675309, you just put your area code in front of it, and there's probably a bunch of other awesome people like you who also don't want to give out their phone number. And um, you get free, you still get the free points and the discounts and all that stuff. So there you go. That's a good one, Michael. I like that. We should that. use and that yeah. as the tip of the week for sure. I mean, yeah. basically, that is now. <laughs> Five, six, seven. But eight six seven five three zero nine. All right, Jill. Eight six seven five three zero nine. Oh, Jill sang to us, Michael. The <laughs> special <laughs> episode. All right, Jill, take us into the gaming. Let's let's talk about something different. Yeah, something happy. There you go. <laughs> something, something that's fun to learn. <laughs> so this week we're highlighting a game that's actually available as a flat pack called Gameiki. That's oh. G-A-M-E-E-K-Y. And I think it's pronounced Gameiki, but not quite sure. It might Listen, be Gameiki. Listen, we'll Gameiki. 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 <laughs> <Yeah. Gamiki. laughs> Gamiki. So this Gamiki. game actually I'm trying to come up with other ones. I don't have any more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was too earlier. So this game lets young learners and educators create and explore games in a cooperative learning 
experience. And it has features like play and explore games with friends. You can create new games without writing any code. That's nice. Brian could use that. Which is really fun. Nice. Tell stories (laughs) through these games. You can nurture artistic skills by designing game objects and creatures. Ooh, I'm going to stick can't, there. Ryan yeah, can't do, can that. do that. He doesn't. You don't have I have a positive skills. use of negative space or something. Oh, yes, you don't have a positive. But Ryan, you, this one you can do. Grasp the basics of programming using Python. Python and a logo-like oh, experience. Yeah. My Python game is hot because I wrote yeah. Michael AI in Python. Yes, so. you did. Yeah. So, Wasn't it in Python? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and you you will get mature programming skills by extending games with Python plugins. And that's hey. always a positive thing. And th- this game is a lot of fun. I actually, you can download some te- templates, one for uh, a farming game and one for an arcade style game and one for a uh, first person style game. Nice. So, and this um, is a flat pack. So this is actually yeah. something you could get for free and people can play it. You don't have to go on steam. If you're one of those folks that don't want to use steam or something else, you got this yeah. available probably in your Linux distro. Yeah. And it's really good in the classroom too. And it's, it's got a very high rating on flat hub <laughs> and it's one of the official apps on flat hub. Yeah. And we came across so many like young and bright kids at scale this year. I think that's one of the things that impressed me the most. We talked about in our last episode about some of our scale experiences. I'm not a kid, Ryan. Yes, you are, Michael. (laughs) I mean, mentally, you're like three. Wow. Uh, This fun educational applications like this get kids into programming, then give them understanding of how games that they love to play are actually made. And then, you know, when you have like my son gets so super mad at Fortnite and things like that, I could be like, well, why don't you try to design a game and see how hard it is to make some of this stuff work so perfectly that you get mad at because, uh, you know, yeah. these games are very okay, sophisticated. First of all, this is, that's a very good point, except for the idea that Fortnite works perfectly. Come on. Yeah. I mean, that's a fun game. It's made by Epic Games. It can't be perfect. You know, you're, Ryan, you're just, have you learned oh. a Fortnite dance recently? I, I don't know. My kids know them all, um, but you know, I know the one that's like, yeah, <laughs> something like that. I think we gotta do like the, kid, yeah. the backpack. Yeah, the look back- at you, Michael. You, man, that's why people need to watch the video version because exactly you missed it. If you're listening to the audio only version, thank you. First of all, thank you. Also, you're missing out on our awesome dancing. <laughs> yeah, if you're listening to this. Thank you, but also, all right. So, software spotlight, Joe. What do we got? This is a really cool one. This is one that I personally use on a regular basis. So like our previous gaming segment, because the rest of this episode was such a downer, (laughs) let's talk (laughs) about something fun and retro in our spotlight. Leave it to Jill to make us all happy. (laughs) (laughs) ASCII art was one of the only options to create graphics on computers, but now it's like vinyl records or VHS tapes. It's Amazing. cool to make things ASCII in a retro kind of way. And yep. yes, it's still cool to play movies on Linux in ASCII. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. That, that is very cool. <laughs> and I think that, that okay, the whole thing you just said, very cool, <laughs> except for VHS tapes. VHS yeah. tapes are dope, man. You know, be kind, what? rewind. Be it kind, doesn't take rewind. you back when you, when you get your hands on an old VHS tape. I was doing some... Um, what do they call it when you you go to these uh, flea markets, but they're like antique stores. I was antiquing and they had a whole sec. Shut up, Michael. Do- stop laughing. I was antiquing. <laughs> Very You're manly antiquing thing. Antiquing for VHS tapes. Yeah. Well, no, but there was a section of VHS tapes. And when I held them in my hand, I remembered, you know, the, the memories of my dad yelling at me because I forgot to rewind it. And just all of the great memories of like Blockbuster charging you you know, $20 overage fees because you forgot to bring the movie yeah. back. All of these amazing memories came flashing back into my head. And I thought, and I miss VHS, you know, you had to work to watch it. <laughs> you oh, know? Boy. Okay. You okay. Have- so, so we, we got to get back days. on track here, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, but before we do, I just want to remind you, you just said that you were nostalgic for blockbuster late fees and rewinding <laughs> and getting yelled at for VHS. I think... These, I, these I are I my childhood it, memories, Michael. I think That's all I got. 
Okay, it's it's fair yeah. that it's nostalgic for you, but doesn't yeah. make it cool. Like at <laughs> <Yeah>. all. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> all right, Joe, con- continue on with the ask. Like, Maybe our records are actually yeah. cool even now. Like yeah. that, that's not. <laughs> yes. The vinyl <laughs> records we can agree are cool. I mean, well, now we got to argue about Betamax versus VHS. <laughs> oh, Betamax all the way, baby. No, well, no, because it couldn't hold an entire movie, so VHS yeah. is better. Yeah, and I didn't get yelled at <laughs> over a Betamax. Resolution. And I didn't get late fees on a Betamax, so I don't have any good and memories related to But you didn't get late fees was... because they weren't available in Blockbuster. <laughs> right. Betamax yeah. was a really nice uh, nice format to edit in. Back in the old days when we had to edit, edit from tape to tape <laughs> manually before the computers huh. came. Interesting. Oh, oh, by the way, okay, yeah. okay. So we're already on this tangent, and I just got to keep going. So Betamax is uh, mm-hmm. funny because everybody talked about how Betamax the quality was better, but it, it couldn't store as much data because the the tapes yeah. were smaller and the the Betamax quality was better, therefore meaning needing more data. And mm-hmm. the VHS basically won because you could get a single movie on a VHS. Yeah, and that was funny, but mm-hmm. also. I learned from some random YouTube video that you ever notice the back of a VHS, um, like the the tape itself has all these weird random holes and you're like, what are these for? And the reason they are there is the most hilarious thing and is like also kind of like, I mean, impressive, but also sketchy. They put these holes in there to make it impossible for the Betamax tapes to work in the VHS players, even though they technically could if those yeah, holes weren't there. Yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> like, Absolutely. That's kind of genius well, that's and evil. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Huh. <laughs> All right, how about Learned we get back new. on You're track? You're full of tips yeah. and tricks this week, Michael. <laughs> I am, I, and yeah. I wasn't even planning to talk about this yeah. particular thing. All right, so Jill. Jill, let's talk about, about what this whole tool. thing is. So this is why our software spotlight is going to unlock a lot of fun for you. <laughs> we got a chance to go down memory lane. Yeah. <laughs> now it's Just your now. turn yep. as a viewer. <laughs> yeah. This awesome software spotlight is a program called Letterpress. Right. And Letterpress lets you convert your images into a picture made up of ASCII characters that you can post on the internets or for us that are old school on the BBSs. <laughs> Ooh. Michael, you could put this, uh, convert your selfies into ASCII and you won't be so ugly. Yeah. Ooh. Aw. Or you can do Jill that. Agreed. Your life doesn't work there. Jill but agreed, by the way. She said, yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Jill. Wow. <laughs> Or when Ryan know. said it, I I was like, oh, whatever, Ryan. But when you <laughs> agreed, Jill, yeah, I did. Jill was like, oh, yeah. so painful. It hurts. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> well, you now I do. feel like I now I feel like a VHS tape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can actually bring in a very beautiful picture of text and do a really high resolution um, ASCII character out out of that image, and you can even right. uh, scale it. Uh, by lines. There's a couple different ways you can scale in this programs. And uh, you can save the output, put to a file, copy it, and even change its resolution with the scale feature. Mm. And this app is also part of GNOME Circle, where developers who make great applications for GNOME can receive advertising and can qualify for the GNOME Foundation membership if selected. Nice. So it's really cool. That's very cool. And I love the the GNOME circle idea, the GNOME circle idea. Yeah. Uh, here's a thought. Anybody who's a developer in that circle, uh, maybe make an app indicator tray. Uh, That's so that a good have. idea. Yeah. Just you a can, thought. In you fact, you can make square versions of the indicator tray. It doesn't have to be yeah. circles. You, you can, can make, make an ASCII them. version of it if you want. That'd be great. Use letterpress yeah. to do that. I like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, you can make the app indicators a flat pack maybe. like. Hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, not really. That's not how it works, but you know, a flat pack plugin. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All so right, Mike. This awesome app is also available as a flat pack. It was like I was foreshadowing something. Yes, oh. you were. <laughs> Jill's like, I still got to get that in, even though Michael mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't technically <laughs> say it. Jill said it, so <laughs> important that we yeah. get it out there. Because okay. by the way, flat packs are dope. So flat good job on the dope. team that made that. They're just like VHS tapes. 
They're dope. No, no, not even. They're, <laughs> they're not even close to not even. Uh, no, they're simpler. They're cleaner. They're just like vinyl records. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, I give you that. Yeah. I give you no, that. That okay. that's a good one. That's a good comparison. So let's move on to something because I think it's gonna be fun. This is an interesting thing that we've we've done before in the past, but not exactly like a, a destination Linux project, mm. and it's time for a new one. So next cloud. Um, I hope you're ready to be put in the game because you're on deck. Boom. Oh, nice <laughs> one, Michael. Thank you. Thank deck, you. Nextcloud. De- oh, man. Good hey, one. it is on my Steam they, Deck. They also have an a, a app inside of Nextcloud yeah, called I, Deck. For I those. got it, Michael. You I mean, for it. those who didn't so know good. what I was referencing. It's you know, so good. Now we've tried Nextcloud in the past, uh, but we ran into some hurdles really early on, and, and that kind of held us back from going all in. But with the recent releases, there's a lot of those hurdles have been addressed, and that's awesome. And we felt it's time to dive in and see if Nextcloud is the next and last cloud for us. Yeah, so this oh. is kind of like a small business test because we're doing all of our business, including our show notes. We use HedgeDoc before and running off Cloud Run, and now we're going to use Nextcloud to store all of our documents. So we're going to do some businessy stuff, Michael. We're going to talk business, like how we can invest in VHS because it's going to come back in a big way. So it's totally coming back, man. Yeah, yeah, totally coming back. So we're going to do business investment stuff. We're going to be doing our show notes in there. We're going to be doing all kinds of cool things. In we're going to buy the brand of Blockbuster, clearly. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to pretend this uh, is a real small business. because <laughs> We're going to pretend that we are actually doing something that yeah. is value of a business. Right. We're going to write our show notes. We're going to share documents. We're going to do our calendar events in here, the works. And it's going to be super, super duper, duper fun, Michael. Super duper fun. It already is actually yeah. super duper fun. I mean, it has been fun because we've been doing this show and that's a fun thing to do. But there Two also weeks, have yeah. been some some issues that... Anyway, so our first few weeks have been um, more of a gaining familiarity after Ryan set up the server. Yeah. Because, uh, th- good job, Ryan. Thank you. Thank See, you. I can compliment you on the show, oh, too. That. This show you know? has two compliments. This- Jill, mark that date down. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I just did. I, I <laughs> okay, took a screenshot, which is All the right, best good. way. <laughs> thanks, Jill. <laughs> so the last two shows have been written in Nextcloud. So this one and the one before. The first one we did with the text uh, text version of Markdown support and that sort of thing. And this week we're trying Nextcloud's Office or ODT, which is also Collabora. So Ryan, what are your thoughts so far? Okay, so I had a really good time last week with the text editor. I was feeling very good about this experiment after doing that. Uh, the Markdown plugin for the text editor is okay. It's not as good as HedgeDoc. HedgeDoc has Markdown down pat. And plus, I'm just used to it. It's kind of like, you know, switching something that you've gotten used to all of its quirks and things like that. And this is a little bit new the way it does things. Uh, The way it keeps everything to the middle of the screen makes it difficult for me to split notes. Like in HedgeDoc, you can have the actual markdown code on the left and you actually have the actual version where the viewable version that you would publish on the right, where the markdown is basically converted into Um, you know, like the headers and all of that type of stuff. Whereas this one, you could do one or the other, right? You could be in the code section, you could be in the view section, but you couldn't be in both. And the way I do this show is I have two screens. So the top screen is the cameras where Jill and Michael are. And then right below that, I have another horizontal screen, which is the show notes. And so I like to have that split there in the middle between the two, because I want to edit on the left side, what I'm reading from the right side. And the fact that that wasn't there uh, was kind of, you know, not my favorite thing. But there was a hedge doc clone plugin for Nextcloud. But when I enabled it, it wasn't working at that point as of last mm. week. So That's I'm hoping whoever's making that gets that to work because be I awesome. think it would yeah. be really cool to have hedge doc inside of Nextcloud. In fact, Nextcloud, if you're listening, and I know you are because we see you at the shows and stuff, um, you got to get hedge doc built in the Nextcloud. Yeah. In fact, After using Calabra, uh, and we'll talk about this more next week because this will be our second week using Calabra. Um, Look, uh, Calabra is, uh, it's just not my favorite thing. It has random. There's some issues, but let's just clear clear up some. We're using the Calabra stuff for our our podcasting and stuff like that. So. We're talking about it in the sense of what we use it for. If you're using just the office side of it in the normal, typical way, it might not be as a problem for you. Um, but there's no, I couldn't find a dark mode. 
And Ew. come on, bro. Yeah, you got you got to have dark mode. There's no different views really that you can set up. Like the only view is like a use tabbed view. Um, you know, so Which I'm just used to being able like to Microsoft Alfred. change different views and things to make the document slightly different. Again, everything's kind of squished to the middle. There's also things when we were trying to type. All of us experienced. Well, me and Jill, I know, experienced this where uh, you started typing writing something and then all of a sudden it jumped you up three spaces. And I think that's probably part of the collaboration where it's not quite synced with the server really well, but didn't have that issue in the TXT uh, files we were working on. Uh, so that jumping is really obnoxious and not my favorite thing. But I mean, I'm going to say, good. you know, overall, everything that we've done so far, we've been able to do it all. We've been able to do the show. We haven't had any major crashes or problems like that. So everything so far is working pretty good, but HedgeDoc, NextCloud, just please <laughs> get HedgeDoc built into NextCloud because yeah, it's so even, dope. I didn't even know there was a plugin for HedgeDoc. That would be so dope. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, just uh, the only real complaint I have about HedgeDoc is its management of documents and files, which is basically what NextCloud is known for is being really good at. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be a great combination. And to yeah. put it nicely for uh, HedgeDoc, the way they manage the files and documents is um, horrendous. Yeah. And well, as, that's nicely talk. because there is no file management at all. Like it's just, yeah. it's like a weird wonky history system that only applies to the individual. And even as admins, we can't manage the docs from anyone other than ourselves, which is super weird because we don't have ability to know how many there are. And that's not a good system. So HedgeDoc, please fix that. Yeah. And also NextCloud, please help. HedgeDoc, hedge fix doc. that and put, do a plugin and stuff. Put a HedgeDoc into the next cloud store and like charge 10 bucks for it. I'd pay it. I'd pay it all day long to get Oh, yeah, for it. sure. Oh, that'd, be, yeah. that'd be super That's worth awesome. it. Yeah, super worth yeah. it. Also, HedgeDoc, by the way, has some functionality with Sublime Text. That's awesome. <sighs> of course. Of course well, you do. know, one of the unique ways we're using show notes is we need it in real time. Yeah, it's it's not just someone going in editing the document, and someone two hours later goes in to edit the document. We have to be all three of us present in the document, and it has to work correctly for us at all times. Yep. And, we're on and also three because we're recording, the US. Yeah, yeah, recording live, we have a, a real time is very important. Absolutely. And also, it's a very good point that you made because what you just said, Jill, is super interesting. And Ryan talked about his layout for mm. how he does this. And I, I don't have a, uh, I have a very different thing. You, you have the horizontal window and the bottom and on the cameras yeah. and everything. I actually have a dedicated monitor that I have it set up. So I have a vertical system mm. and that vertical system has a similar problem of not, not requiring a certain layout to make it work right. Uh, and this didn't work. So as Jill mentioned of doing in real time, I could not use it. I had to switch it all out into a text editor. and. That, and that was kind of weird text. because to copy and paste it out to put it in the text editor, it wanted you to download it. Oh, that was the, yeah. and the best part about it is when, when I instead of just copy, copy paste. Yeah, when I clicked copy, it gave me a notice saying, "If you want to copy this, you need to down." Why? And also, yeah. I just wanted to download the text. And when I tried to, there's no text option. There's a rich text option, like but RTF, but that's not helpful because I don't want any of the extra nonsense. I just want the text. So the way I did it was. Uh, not great. I had to download a ODT file, upload that to Google Drive, oh. and then copy the text from there. Come on, Michael. Oh gosh, that's. I don't. I didn't have an a, a, an ODT application installed oh, in this man. machine that's... because, again, we remember, remember that's rough. We have Next so many drives rough. with you different. Got... <laughs> but that's why we're doing this. It's not to beat up on anybody. It's yeah. not to make anybody feel bad. I think Nextcloud has done some incredible things. We're going to talk about those incredible yeah. things as we continue this series, but. We're having oh, yeah. the real conversations about what this is going to be like for people who are small businesses, not necessarily open source or Linux enthusiasts. They just wanting a good cloud solution. And there's a lot of things NextCloud has going for it, but we're going to call out the things that aren't going for it well either. But the server was super simple to set up and the server has been running flawlessly and we've been able to do all of our work uh, so far and get all of our files uploaded and share them and create oh, users yeah. very easily and simply. And so also got last week, the text system worked for the most part. Like, yeah, I like the yeah, text system better than well. ODT. Yeah, Calabra. Yeah. It's not really good for what we're using it for. Um, moving on, though, we have an event that you're going to be able to see Michael and Mia. Unfortunately, Jill can't make it this year, but Red Hat Summit, May 6th through the 9th in Denver, Colorado. Michael and I will be there. 
So this is really exciting, and thanks to Red Hat for inviting us to this. But the Red Hat Summit and Ansible Fest brings together IT professionals, customers, partners, and peers to provide you tools, connections, and knowledge. Uh, they've got all kinds of really amazing panels and awesome people giving talks and real cool technology to check out. So we're very excited to be there, and we hope to see you there. If you see us there, come up and say hi, unless you're wearing Crocs. I mean, just if you're walk. wearing Crocs, you should go directly to Ryan and say, see? Check these out. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. did that at scale. It was yeah, really yeah. Awesome. it was awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, just real quick, uh, Ryan, you forgot to say it, so I'll say it for you. The Red Hat Summit is right around the corner. So if you're going to be there... <laughs> it is right around the corner. Too. It is right around the corner, actually. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening. However you do it, we love your faces. Yes, even if you wear Crocs, because if you're getting offended by this, we really don't care what you wear on your feet. It's, it's a joke, people. Come join us in our Discord. Go to tuxdigital.com slash Discord. In fact, our patrons, now when you join the patron-only room in the Discord, you could just stay there and hang out because when we're recording the live show, we have the room that we pipe in to our live recording right from Discord, so you can watch the show live right there. You don't have to leave the one. It's just one spot. You just go to Discord. You got everything you need right there, One Michael. stop shop. One stop shop. Discord. Yeah. Tuxdigital.com slash Discord. <laughs> there you go. And if you want to watch the show live, like we talked about, you become a patron by going to Tuxdigital.com slash membership, and you get a bunch of awesome other perks. So, for example... We Not only can you watch the show live, we also have the patron-only post show that happens every week after the show mm. where you can hang out and talk with us and ask us any questions, tell Ryan what color favorite croc is, all sorts of things. <laughs> Go to tuxdigital.com slash membership to sign up and get all of the awesome benefits. Plus, if you would like to help out the show and the network, you can do so by going to the Tux Digital store at tuxdigital.com slash store, where you have a lot of cool swag like t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, coasters, stickers, and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. You can even get your I Heart Andreas shirt Right from the Tux Digital shirt. You know what? Uh, I think we should absolutely do that. That would Have be really cool. Have an iHeart Andreas. That would be dope. Great idea. Because yes. like the iHeart Linux and Microsoft, but it's uh, iHeart Andreas because he helped solve this major thing. Uh, yeah, oh, he would love that. that. And make sure to check out all the amazing shows here on Tux Digital. That's right. We have a whole network of shows to fill your entire week with geeky goodness. Check out This Week in Linux for your source for Linux Weekly Good News, which is a weekly video podcast that our very own Michael hosts that takes you all right. through all the happenings of Linux and open source oh, each right. and every week. And everyone head to textdigital.com and subscribe to all our great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks everyone. <laughs> we'll see you next Thank week. You. Also, you all. especially Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> especially Andreas. That would be funny. Uh, my britches are on fire. <laughs> I just want to say that. I don't know why. My britches are on fire, Michael. Yeah. My britches. I don't know why you want to. Uh, uh, I, I just I don't know. I felt like that's like a cartoon. <laughs> My britches are on fire. That was a fun joke. I so I, so that. also, <laughs> you know what's interesting that I was thinking about? So knickerbockers. Yeah. There's also like a phrase referring to like knickers, and those are also underwear. And yeah. And then when I was I was mm. looking it up, um, both of those mean pants, and in England, pants means underwear. So I'm not really sure what we're talking about anymore. You know, anymore. in England, they uh, also eat foot fungus and put it on their toast and stuff. So, like, can we really... So, okay, that? first of all, I thought you were being rude, and then you talked about the whole... Um, what's toast? that stuff? What's that disgusting Marmalade stuff or whatever it's called? Marmite. That's right. Marmite, Marmite, yeah. That is exactly what that is. Unless yeah, you want to say, fungus. like, if it's, like, asphalt tar that's liquefied, that's yeah. also okay. accurate. Yeah. That stuff is disgusting. That is so gross, man. Like, so we can't trust anything from England because of that. So, <laughs> the fact that they call sorry, fact, Wimpy. Aww, we're, cro we're, we're crocs created in England. I gotta find out now. Uh, you said, where, I don't think so. We're crocs. No, I, I think that's a West invented. Coast thing. <laughs> uh, the, before we end this recording, crocs I gotta is find an American out. footwear company. In oh, how Field, dare you disappoint us, America. Colorado. We're going to Colorado, yeah. Michael. Why the Crocs are made. Can we tour the Croc factory while we're there? Oh, we please, should. Michael, you should. Please. 
How far is that from from Denver? No, I'm gonna look it up because we need to go. That would be a, hilarious. If you guys want to imagine if we filmed from the Crocs. Like, factory. hey, Red Hat, we can't come to one of the days because we're going to the Crocs factory. <laughs> but we'll make sure you'll make sure to buy Red Crocs, right? Yeah, that's true. That's oh, a good man. Point. Well, Solution well. found. <clears throat> Distance from Denver, Colorado. Right? It's in Denver. Denver. Yeah. Colorado. Okay. Let's see here. I like how you said Colorado correctly that time, but every other time it's Colorado. 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 Oh, it's only 13.54 miles. Oh, wow. You guys got to go. Okay, let me go Croc Factory uh, tour. Surely they have a tour of the Croc Factory where they melt all the plastic and the poisonous (laughs) gas and you get to sniff it in. (laughs) All right, let's see here. Exclusive look inside new global headquarters in Broomfield. 177,000 square feet to make plastic shoes? Good Lord. <laughs> Man. You know what? I'm going to end the recording right now so we can figure <laughs> out. This is why curious. you become a patron so you can hear the yep. rest of this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs>